you so much for having me. So over the past decade or so, I've become obsessed with one big question, and that is, what does it mean to feel like you are a reasonable person with the right to tell other people how they should behave? So this all started when I had my first baby, Monty. Whether it was um, checking my email while the kids were playing in the park or trying to stop them crying desperately on a bus, my experiences of being a parent have largely been coloured by the knowledge that at any time I'm probably being watched and judged by strangers who all seem to think that they know what's best. And that started, really, it started immediately. So Monty was born in, I'm going to get this right, um, in August 2014. And despite a lot of support from the great midwives, I was finding feeding him really challenging. So I think he was just a couple months old. And I was still in the stage where it really felt like someone was holding a lit match to my nipples and then breastfeeding spread all over the news in the UK. And that was because a mother sitting in a restaurant feeding her child had been told to cover up with a tablecloth. But that only really went viral when Nigel Farage, who was then the leader of UKIP, waded into the debate and he said, on a radio interview, he said, it's not too hard, surely, to breastfeed discreetly. And then the internet erupted. So on the one side, the arguments went, it's the legal right of feeding parents not to be made to feel uncomfortable when they're giving their children the necessary nourishment for them to stay alive. But on the other, the opposite side of the argument said that it's well, it's my fellow citizens' right to expect that people like me who are feeding our child, children in public should take reasonable measures not to inflict our breasts onto others and make them feel uncomfortable. It's just about manners, consideration, common sense. And watching that online backlash unfold, what I realised is that Everyone had a really different idea about what it means to be reasonably discreet. Does it mean facing the wall? Does it mean slinking away to the loo? Does it mean getting out only one boob at a time rather than whopping out both simultaneously? And how can anyone confidently really advise on what a reasonable level of discretion actually looks like if they don't have any understanding of my personal circumstances or how hard and how painful it was, how it needed me to sit totally still for an hour sometimes so that things didn't slip and cause agony. And in many cases, without the commenter perhaps having even that experience of owning a pair of breasts. And yet, just be reasonable, people kept saying. Why is that so hard? And then I began noticing that word reasonable everywhere. And what I realized is that what seems reasonable to one person is to another person totally rude. So I started a research project to study that reasonableness in action. My specialism is theater audiences. So whether it's watching a Brecht play or um, watching a political phenomenon like the Brexit referendum. I am endlessly fascinated by how we can watch the same event unfolding but come to such completely different understandings about what it means. And around that same time, as part of my day job, I've been getting really interested in the post-millennial rise of a specific term. That term was theatre etiquette. So what I noticed was around the world, all these opinion pieces and articles, they kept popping up using that term. And the general vibe was that audiences in theatres are getting increasingly badly behaved. They don't know how to behave when they're in the theatre or in the cinema anymore. So we need to retrain them in what it means to be polite. So, for example, on Broadway, there was a famous case where a drunk person climbed up on stage and plugged their phone into a fake socket on the set in the West End in London someone else apparently used the interval to run out and grab a KFC bargain bucket but also 
just an absolute swarm of complaints about people using phones and drinking and chatting and singing along, things like that. So I did a deep dive into those ideas of manners and consideration and common sense using theatre etiquette as a case study. And I found that none of this is actually as simple as it seems, because manners historically, I found, have often been used, well, they used to make shared social life better and cleaner and safer for everyone. Manners are often a really good thing, of course. But sometimes they've also been wielded as a weapon used to disempower and, dis and divide us. So, for example, rules like, um, like wash your hands before eating foods. I mean, that's, I think most people can agree that that's a self-evidently good thing. But think about other rules, rules like which set of cutlery should I use first at a posh dinner? That's all about figuring out who belongs at the table and who doesn't. So that was my first foray really into understanding how common sense can be uncommon in ways that we don't necessarily understand. And it's the same in theatre, I found. So rules like don't use a mobile because it's disrespectful or distracting to performers or wait until the interval before you go to the loo. Those things often seem like common sense. It's just about consideration for other people's people. But we also need to consider that others might have other needs. Like, for example, the woman quite recently who got really upset because she needed to glance discreetly at her phone. She was using it as a disability aid and she was publicly shamed. Or our inability to know whether the people um, ambling past us down the aisle has had too many pints or might have a condition that makes them need the loo more often, for example. So I wrote a big academic analysis of these theatre etiquette debates. And I thought I was done. I thought I'd said everything I needed to say. But then COVID hit and I realised that I had so much more that I wanted to investigate here because what I found was that those reasonable judgments were extending into every aspect of social life. So questions like, should we wear masks? And if so, in what situations? Those are still rumbling on today. Or is it okay to apply makeup on, on public transport? Or is that a rude thing to do? Should kids be banned from restaurants? And if so, which ones? And those little arguments, I think, expose much deeper, bigger fractures, like our views on whether or not we should have a monarchy and how they should act, or on, or on acts of public protest, or, or neighbourhood behaviour policing on apps like Nextdoor, for example. And so I wrote a whole new book, which was On Being Unreasonable, which Stephanie's kindly popped in the chat. And this traces the emergence of a philosophical concept called the reasonable man standard, which from about the eight, 1800s onwards, that became embedded in every aspect of the international legal system. It was used to judge everything from reasonable accommodations in disability law to reasonable use of force in cases of police brutality to reasonable conduct in complaints about sexual harassment. And that reasonable man standard, which evolved into the reasonable person test, that has also become embedded, I think, in every aspect of social life itself. That's what I track in the book. It's become part of those respectability politics narratives about the need to control and repress and restrain every aspect of our lives, our minds, our bodies, our emotions, and our lived environment itself in a way that I think, and I argue, is destroying our sense of community and spoiling the natural world that we live in. Okay, but in law, in, as in life, of course, we need a way to draw those reasonable lines. We need a way to separate a mechanism for separating good from bad, appropriate from inappropriate, acceptable from unacceptable, moral from immoral, lawful from unlawful. Of course, we need a way to draw those lines. 
But what I argue and what all this research has told me is that we also need to think really carefully and critically about who overwhelmingly has had the power to draw those lines and to make those rules. Who do they benefit and who disproportionately do they harm? So the big question now that my book on being unreasonable asks is, in a world where we all think we're being reasonable, how can we really figure out what's right? How can we have those debates? How can we ask and answer those questions as a collective in a way that supports and uplifts everyone? And also in cases of great injustice, whether it's the climate crisis or racial discrimination or violence against women, in cases where being reasonable and calm and engaging in endless civil debate hasn't fixed things, then maybe in those cases, maybe we need to give ourselves and others permission to be unreasonable where necessary to make the world a better place, even if that means breaking the rules.